Hi, I'm Fred Corral, and today's presentation is on curveballs. You see behind me, there's the Cal logo, and below it is a website, uh, SaveCalBaseball.com. That's SaveCalBaseball.com. And uh, the reason uh, for that, uh, and the reason for me wearing this hat, is uh, not only did I play for the University of California back in 86 to 88, but, and not only do I stand before you as a coach, as a result of the coaches that I had, Bob Milano, John Hughes, Alan Regeer, and Paul Moore, they, they taught me a great deal of how to be a leader or how to coach. Uh, and I, I try to emulate those uh, gentlemen as, as much as I can. And now, uh, the reason I'm coming before you with this uh, in the background is that four and a half months ago, the athletic department decided to drop five programs at the University of California, Berkeley. One of those programs was Cal Baseball. Uh, when this occurred, uh, Cal Baseball alum got together and we rallied. We rallied the best that we could. And since then, just recently, uh, in our fundraising efforts of all these programs, they, uh, Cal has decided to reinstate uh, three of them. And we're very ecstatic uh, over the fact that three have been reinstated. But Cal Baseball and Cal Gymnastics are currently in limbo. And there are 35 young men who had came to Cal Baseball not only for its 119 year tradition and not simply for the simple fact that uh, when you look at colleges out there, the University of California is one of the top schools that currently has active major leaguers uh, in, the, uh, in the major leagues. So uh, these young men went there for a reason and to simply have the rug swept under their feet um, you know, and the coaching staff there, um, we need to make a, a, a step forward. We need to uh, try to help save this uh, fine tradition. Um, and I, that's the purpose of my uh, having this. My thoughts are, if you would pay for a lesson, a pitching lesson, and whatever you might pay, uh, I know you don't have to pay anything here at YouTube. Everything's free. Information's free. But I want to ask you, with the passion that you have in baseball, you're here uh, watching this clip to learn about curveballs. And uh, hopefully I'm going to give you great information on that. Hopefully it's going to be good enough for you to see the, the lesson value in it. And maybe you could go to SaveCalBaseball.com and make a donation uh, and place in the comments area, you're doing it just because it's baseball. And your heart tells you to do that. So this is my outreach. If you find that this lesson is good enough, please go to SaveCalBaseball.com, make a... Uh, a donation, same way that you would as a lesson, but know that not only are you benefiting your child or your players or you personally, uh, but you're also helping a program and 35 other classy young men that uh, need your help as well. With that, uh, I'll go and uh, the greatest uh, determiner of what uh, type of breaking ball you're going to throw is arm slots. Okay, you can see behind me I have a uh, low three-quarter arm slot, uh, sidearm arm slot, an over-the-top arm slot, and a submarine arm slot. And uh, as you can see behind me, there are different pitches that you can throw. And obviously, over-the-top to three-quarters allows for a wider array of pitches. As you go down to the low three-quarter to sidearm, you start losing the, the, the selection that you have or the capability of throwing these pitches because of your arm slot and even lower you drop even more so but I might add that dropping these pitches doesn't make it uh, invaluable uh, the fact that you're throwing from a low uh, sidearm to submarine is you're unique not many uh, pitchers out there do that so hitters aren't uh, too familiar with that so uh, it's a benefit to give them a form of uh, deception in that they don't see that all the time so know that your uh, arm slot will dictate the pitch types that you throw. Um, in my changeup talk, I talked about the, the fact that the ball has parts. And you can see, you know, when I mentioned that you envisioned it in a cube, I, I, I got a little illustration here. And in that cube, the ball has a back of the ball, it has a front of the ball, it has a top, it has a bottom, and it has an inside and an outside if this is closest to my head. If this is the back of the ball and this is closest to my head, this would be the inside and the furthest part would be the outside. So uh, knowing that the ball has parts will enable you to have a better understanding of how to make it rotate, how to have a better spin, and 
thus have better movement. The curveball uh, grips. There are two types of uh, curveballs uh, that I'm going to show uh, right now. And actually, there's more than two types, but the two that I'm going to cover is the traditional curveball and the spike curveball. Uh, the traditional curveball, uh, you can see from my, is when you find your grip, okay, well you got to throw the top front of the curveball. In this, you got to find a grip, and you got to you got to grip it in a manner in which it the it allows you to command the pitch. And this requires you to have a 50-50 grip. Now, what I want you to see is that this ball, as it sits here, as this seam goes down, if it continued to go through that opening, it would connect with the other seam on the bottom here. This is a good reference to find out if you got this ball in a 50-50 grip. Okay, too many uh, young men will favor one side, okay, and in doing this they have 60% of the ball on this side and 40 on this side. So what I just mentioned is you got to have a grip in which you can command the ball. By having this grip where there's more ball to the, to the top of the hand, this will make it very top heavy and the ball is going to come out the back of the hand naturally just because you've got less of the ball to throw. Well while having less of the ball, you're also going to have less command. And not only that, but it's also going to get loopy. Tony Gwynn mentioned that, you know, the way that he would pick the curveball is he'd see the little hump that came out of it. Well, if you hold it in this less than 50 degrees, it's going to have a bigger hump, thus making it recognizable uh, by the hitter. So, I like to tell my guys to get to the middle, their middle finger and on one seam, and their thumb on another, and then place that index right there, okay? Now, here's a big league tip, okay? If the reason the curveball will not go as fast as your fastball is you have uh, your hand is on the outside of the ball. As a result of being on the outside of the ball, uh, the fingers are the only thing holding it. As a result of the fingers only being the, the part holding it uh, and the energy going to the outside part of the ball, uh, the ball will be slower. Okay. Now, how do I make this breaking ball harder? Well, a big league tip would be to understand this. Okay. This grip right here. Okay, you can see my thumb's not on the ball, but you can see that I've got the ring finger and my middle finger holding the ball here. And there's pressure, obviously, going to the ball uh, as I'm uh, holding this through the front part of the ball. Now when I apply my thumb, I now have pressure going from the top front to through the middle, and I get this triangle of pressure. By having more to hold on to the ball, the ball more than likely is going to hold on to or retain the arm speed of the, of the pitch. Uh, it's still going to be slower, but it's going to be of your fastball grip or breaking ball grips, both in the traditional and the spike, it will be the hardest one you throw. Okay, and I'll get into uh, the knuckle curveball uh, later. Um, but now the spike curveball. Okay. Uh, many of us, uh, when you think of the knuckle curveball, you think, well, now I'm going to simply put my knuckle up, put this finger up, okay, and this is the knuckle curveball. But if you throw it in this manner, it's just simply a variation of the traditional curveball, but by spiking that finger, okay, you enable more area for the ball to come out, more area for the ball to come out, and it's easier for that rotation to start, okay, so by having this grip, it's a spike curveball, but having less fingers on it and it may going uh, through the top front, it's going to be slower. So this is the con of the pitch. It'll be easier, but it's going to be slower than the traditional curveball that you can throw. It is not the knuckle curveball. The knuckle curveball will be the fastest breaking ball you throw, and it'll probably be the dirtiest breaking ball you throw. And I'll get to that at the at, at the end here. So uh, understanding those two grips. Now, uh, the four-step uh, lead-up that I want to show you to learning this uh, pitch, okay? The four-step lead-up, you can see uh, Luke Kochaver here, uh, and we started out in this lunge position. I might add that my wife is the one that came up with this drill, and uh, she did so a week after we got married. Uh, while in Jupiter, Florida, I was coaching the Expos, and uh, I was given an assignment to help a, a Latin kid throw a breaking ball. Uh, communication kept us uh, from attaining that goal and when I went home I said hey you know I was bummed out and my wife said uh, well why don't you teach me how to throw a curveball and uh, I said well why would I do that she said well I had known nothing about it so if you can teach me you can then show that young man I said that was a good call so I went about it 
And uh, she said, what's the most important thing about the curveball? Well, the most important thing about the curveball is getting to a position where your chest and your hips are to your target, and you allow the elbow to get to about the area of your chin so you can throw the top front of this pitch, to throw the top front, okay? And she said, well, why don't we start out that way? So this is what led into uh, backward chaining, if you, uh, and backward chaining wasn't even a term uh, for me or in my vocabulary at that point. We just felt that, okay, we'll go from that point and work back. This is our lunge position uh, at release, okay? So starting in that lunge position, uh, this young man is throwing uh, his breaking ball with a softball. Having a bigger apparatus increases your awareness, and by getting to the top front of this big, bigger apparatus, it'll be that much easier when you go back to the baseball. Not only that, but going with a softball uh, at this short distance of 30 feet, you'll be able to see the break. So you get a visual image of the type of break that you're going to get with this fast, with this baseball uh, when you go to it. So not only do you get go from big to small, and you'll see that uh, the comment, if you try this, going back to the break of uh, baseball will seem like going to a golf ball. So getting to the top front will be a lot easier. Uh, so at this short distance, you'll be able to see that break. The next part is this walking bows, okay? Uh, here we separate, we leave the arm back, and you can see as he pulls back that bow-like action and throws the top front, we are getting back to that first step that he went through. So we'll go five with that lunge position, and then we'll go five walking bows. And as he goes, he'll go work uh, that arm back and then fire his backside and get to his, where his chest and his hips are to his target uh, like he did in the first step. This is a side view of it, and you can see that when he goes, uh, he steps, leaves his arm back, kind of like pulling back a bow, and then uh, getting those, that hips and his chest to his target. So leaving his arm back, pulling back the bow, getting that uh, chest and hips towards his target. Then from there, we go to a rock, load, and explode. So rocking in between the knees, in between the knees, we will rock back and forth, and then once we get to our weight to our back knee, separate our hands and fire our backside. So uh, here you see him as he gets to his backside, he, fires, he separates his hands and fires his backside. Here's an image from the side. Rock and load, inside the feet, over the knees, he gets back, separation, fire the backside. Again, it's key that you don't get outside your knees because you don't want to get soft on that stride leg. So when you get to the back, separate your hands, fire the back side, chest and hips towards your target. Then you go into fluid runs. This is where we'll grab the baseball and basically at 60 feet kind of retain everything that we just did from that backward chaining part. Uh, so we'll go with a, here he's going with an abbreviated leg lift, but with the baseball it's separation, fire the back side, get uh, the ball going towards the target. So this four-step lead-up, uh, I'm very thankful for my wife, uh, uh, not only because it just verified that I married the right woman, uh, but uh, we haven't had a tough time teaching the breaking ball with this four-step lead-up. So hopefully this will be beneficial to you. Um, the next thing, the knuckle curveball. Now this is the